Good evening, everyone. I'm Sandra Trock, Assistant Superintendent of Teaching and Learning, and I'm pleased to be joined by my colleagues this evening on this webinar and who are introduced on this next slide. I want to note at the top that this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the literacy website for the Wellesley Public Schools. I'd like to welcome everyone to our K-5 Elementary Literacy Instruction Webinar for Wellesley Public Schools. I'd like to especially recognize and thank Jennifer Friedman, Elementary Literacy Department Head, and our principals, directors, literacy specialists, and student services colleagues from across the district. The colleagues you'll meet this evening and many more in similar roles were involved in designing and preparing the literacy coffees that were recently held in each of the elementary schools. Together, we thank you for taking the time to join us this evening, and we hope the, this presentation is informative. Our goal this evening is to overview our K-5 comprehensive literacy program, in particular, how we teach critical skills of phonemic awareness and phonology, as well as the processes of reading and writing. We'll also share the elementary literacy curricular materials that we use and how do we utilize assessment to continuously inform instruction. Our overarching commitment is excellence and equity for every student. And to us, this means that we aim to have all of our students read on benchmark and beyond. And when support is needed, that we provide that teaching and support in a strategic and timely way to ensure their success. A few final notes before we begin. Again, this webinar is being recorded and it is a view only webinar. Second, prior to this event, a link was sent by the elementary principals to parents and caregivers to submit questions in advance of this evening. We've taken all the questions as of this morning and created a frequently asked questions and responses at the end of this presentation. And last, post this event, this webinar and slide deck will be posted on the literacy webpage for the Wellesley Public Schools. We hope you'll find this useful. At this time, I'd like to welcome and introduce Jen Friedman, K-5 Literacy Department Head, to start us off. Jen, welcome. Thank you, Sandy, and thank you to everyone for being here tonight. Um, I'm going to start us off by saying that um, I'm hoping that as when we leave this evening, you'll have an understanding of our program and really that um, our goal is to be responsive to all of our individual students. So when we think about our literacy program, we really think about being responsive to student needs. Um, tonight, we're going to focus on three different areas. We're gonna take a look at what is reading, really understanding the science and research behind reading. Um, we will talk about our instructional approach and how we teach each reader. We often say um, in our department and with our teachers that we teach the reader, not the reading. So we really want to make sure that that's emphasized. Um, and we'll take a look at our curriculum and our assessment. So we're going to dive right in and think about what reading actually is. And for um, anyone who was able to attend the coffees, this was the point where we actually put people to work. And we're not able to do that tonight. But I do encourage you after this webinar that when you are reading something next, um, whether you're picking up the newspaper or reading online or your favorite book, just to take a couple of minutes and really um, think about what you're doing as a reader, because what we want to talk about are all of the complex pieces that are involved in the teaching of reading. So reading of itself is a complex system um, that really derives meaning from print. We're seeking to derive meaning from print, and it requires many different pieces. Some of them, as skilled, fluent readers that we are as adults, we don't even think about, but I want to share each one of these pieces. So the first piece is really having knowledge and understanding about how phonemes or those sounds in speech work and how those sounds are connected to print. As adult skilled readers, we are constantly using our knowledge of phonemes in our reading, but it is completely automatic and we never think about it. But for our students, our youngest students in elementary school, we are really teaching them about phonemic awareness. Reading also involves decoding, the ability to decode unfamiliar words. Um, it's That's the phonics work. It's the understanding of how letters 
match to sound and how when letters are put together, the sounds they make, we're able to decode. Again, for us as adult fluent readers, that's a very automatic process that we don't think about. And our goal is for our students to become very automatic in that work. Uh, reading involves fluency, the ability to read fluently, to think about how phrases, words and phrases go together, how they sound. When we are reading, um, for example, if there's a piece of dialogue in our reading, whether we're reading out loud or in our own minds, we are able to really think about how that might sound and how smoothly it goes. And so skilled readers read very fluently. Reading also involves background information and vocabulary. All of the information that we have and know about the world and how it works, experiences that we've had, um, really support comprehension and all of the words and meanings of words really impact um, how we are as readers. And so often um, we'll read a favorite book or a book will become a favorite because it can connect to our own lives. We might read an informational piece um, and learn a lot of new vocabulary, or maybe it's connected to something else that we know a lot about, or maybe it helps us build knowledge. So background information and vocabulary is also a critical piece. Reading also involves using appropriate active strategies to construct meaning. So sometimes we might be reading something and we think it, um, at first it's about one thing, and then we discover as we read on, it's about something else. And then we realize, oh, wait, that's what this is really about. And then we might go back and read um, read again and go back and try it again. That's a strategy. Thinking about if you're scanning a piece, for example, and you're looking at the headings and you're trying to decide, I'll read this part first, I'll read this part next. That's also a strategy. Um, and readers use active strategies all the time to construct meaning. And then finally, Reading involves um, motivation. We want our students to be engaged, to stay motivated, to read. Even if something is difficult, we stick with it. I think many of us can remember experiences in college and graduate school in our work lives where we've had to read something quite dense um, and it's hard and it might feel laborious, but we stay motivated and continue to stick with it um, so that we can that we can get through it and we can understand it. And we want our readers to really be motivated and engaged and we want them to be motivated to read different kinds of texts. So another way of thinking about it is by looking at um, what is known as Scarborough's reading rope. This is a this is a graphic to really um, describe and think about all of the different pieces involved in the teaching of reading. So all of the things that, we just named are involved in this rope. And if you look at the rope, I'm gonna to try to use my cursor. I'm not sure if you'll be able to see, but we have the each individual strand of the rope. So all of the things that we just named, the phonological awareness, decoding, spelling, word recognition, background information, each one of those things is a strand. And as readers become more skilled, our goal is to get to the tightly knit part of the rope. And that's really what skilled reading is, that a skilled fluent reader, um, such as ourselves as adults, all of the pieces are woven together tightly. And most of the time, we don't even have to think about them. But as you're starting out as a reader, each piece is critically important and each piece needs to be taught and is learned. So that's, another, that's one way, another way of looking at reading and thinking about it is through Scarborough's reading rope. And then finally, there's another graphic that I'd like to share. This is um, a newer research study that takes all of those pieces and puts it into um, another form of graphic. And you'll notice on your screen, there's a QR code. This graphic came from a study uh, recently done by Nell Duke. And if you're interested in the, in the larger study and all of the detail in it, you can use um, another device to scan that QR code and it should pull up that piece of research. It's um, looking uh, at a less simplistic view of reading. And so this graphic um, illustrates the same things that we just talked about in Scarborough's reading rope, but it includes something else um, that's highlighted that we think is really noteworthy. And it's really looking at how important active self-regulation is. 
Um, we know how important motivation and engagement is in learning how to read, but self-regulation is equally as important. Um, and as we think about our students and wanting to help them develop executive function skills, the ability to attend to something for a sustained period of time, um, the ability to persevere when something is hard, um, all of those pieces to self-regulate, all of those pieces are executive function skills, and they really do impact um, becoming a reader. And so um, in this study, Nell Duke really highlights and talks about the importance of executive function um, and active self-regulation self in addition to all of the other complex pieces in the teaching of reading. The next piece we'll take a look at is orthographic mapping. And um, Kristen Stetzel, the literacy specialist at Fisk, is going to take us through orthographic mapping. So orthographic mapping, we know from brain research, is the process by which we store printed words in our brain. We take the meaning of the word. So for example, the word cat, we know cat is attached to an object. We take the sounds in cat, the phonemes, individual sounds. So readers might say it's cat. And we also take the graphemes, which are the letters that represent those sounds. And all together, those store in our brain so that the more we encounter that word, the more quickly we remember it. Our discipline used to think that the word was stored as a whole word in the brain, but we've evolved. There's been more research on this matter, and we know now that fluent readers process phoneme by phoneme. Cat is a regular word. You would expect these sounds, but for example, the word said, the AI makes a short E sound, which is unexpected. And in the classroom, we call attention to that. And we use orthographic mapping as a technique to remember that in said, AI can say an S sound, and we call attention to the irregularity of that. So using research and um, the scientific method, we teach students to map these words in their brain. So the letters that we see with our eyes and the sounds that we hear get processed all together in the brain and they get stored all together. So Melissa our, Clancy, oh, sorry, Melissa, I was just going to okay. introduce you. Melissa Clancy, our <laughs> literature specialist at So, so I'm going to go that. ahead. <laughs> so our instructional approach at the Wellesley Public Schools aligns with Allington's six T's. Um, and like Jen mentioned earlier, there is a QR code for who anyone wants to dig deeper in his research of what he found in exemplary classrooms. Um, in our classrooms in the Wellesley Public Schools, we believe that children um, are, do have exemplary teachers. Um, students spend time in classrooms reading real books and writing instead of what Ellington calls um, stuff, which might be some of the things uh, uh, growing up that we might have experienced for reading, which stuff would be learning through worksheets or test prep or dictionary skills, which isn't real reading. So I'm going to, I just want to add a little bit here too. Allington really looked um, across many classrooms, um, dozens and dozens of classrooms actually across districts and wanted to look at high achieving classrooms. And so he looked at um, districts that were urban, suburban, rural, all he cut across all kinds of places. And the six T's, what Melissa has talked about here, um, are, or what Allington has dubbed the six T's, really are what came out of that study. Where there was high achievement, it wasn't because of a single curriculum. Um, it really had to do with effective teachers and making, and those teachers did these six things. There was time to read, um, there was a high volume of accessible texts. Um, short bursts of really explicit teaching of a skill with then time to practice, lots of talk between not just um, teacher and student, but among students themselves. Um, tasks, as Melissa said, were really um, authentic and meaningful rather than just lots of different compliance tasks. And then um, lots of assessment or tests that fits into the T's that really looked at student growth so that teachers could make decisions um, about next moves and in instruction. And as Melissa said, you can use the QR code to get to that study to understand more about it. But it's a very foundational piece of our work um, in terms of how we approach instruction with our students. 
Uh, so Melissa, you're going to talk about workshop next. Yes. So in our workshop model, teachers are always giving children explicit instruction, which is modeled during our mini lesson. And children actually during that mini lesson have some guided practice before they're actually going into the workshop to be reading and writing. During workshop time, children are getting small group instruction. So students should know what they're working on as readers and writers, while teachers are pulling children into small groups and giving them, um, just like Jen just had said, target instruction based on their needs. Um, so different kids in, in classrooms can be doing different things and groups can change in classrooms. Um, and that's that last piece where we go back to Allington with independent practice, where we know the volume of read reading does matter. So it's very common in primary classrooms, especially where children will be um, have a, a basket of books and they'll be practicing and rereading books again and again. And that structure we use in reader's workshop and writer's workshop. Um, and I'm gonna switch here and Nina Khan, who is our literacy specialist at Hardy is gonna talk a little bit about what that journey really looks like um, over the course of a child's elementary school life. Thanks, Jen. We are using this slide to remind ourselves of all that students learn from kindergarten through fifth grade. And it's one of the best things about working in an elementary school is getting to see those little people um, turn into these amazing preteens. The sample of work on the right side is from a second grade classroom. And in this classroom, the students were working on foundational skills and this student was marking up some words to show their understanding of something we call the 111 rule. And um, that means that the student needs to understand about the root word or the base word and how to spell it. They have to understand that there are suffixes that are vowel suffixes and consonant suffixes. And then they need to know what happens when you add those um, to change the word. And so, you know, again, all very complex. Um, on the right, we have an example of an MCAS question from fifth grade, and I made it bigger because I can't read that small. The question itself reads, um, compare the speaker's attitude in first night to the speaker's attitude in beech leaves. Be sure to use details from both poems to develop your essay. So this is just to remind us that we ask students to do very complex work um, for a fifth grader to be able to write this kind of essay on demand in an MCAS situation. They need to be able to read both poems, understand the concept of the speaker's attitude, infer, um, and then they need to create an essay. And the reason our students are able to do this is because they've had the great work of foundational skills and thinking since kindergarten and talking about their reading, um, and they do so much writing to think, and they also do so much essay writing. So um, our kids are able to do this. Thanks, Nina. And um, just to highlight, as Nina said, all of this work begins um, in kindergarten. We focus a lot on foundational skills, but we do get at the higher level thinking as well in kindergarten. And we do have um, specific curricular materials that we use to get to each of these pieces. So I'm going to let Kristen talk a little bit um, about our curricular materials. So as Jen said before, we do differentiate for students, but we do offer common core curricular experiences or materials that we use for all students. So in every kindergarten and first grade classroom, we use the Hegarty phonemic awareness curriculum. We know that phonemic awareness or the ability to hear and manipulate individual sounds in words is essential to the reading process. Readers cannot read without it. Um, we do spend 10 minutes a day in K and one classrooms developing this at the oral level. We also in kindergarten through third grade use the foundations program. This is a whole class um, part. It's made by Wilson. You may have heard of the Wilson program. Wilson is um, used in special education, but in classrooms K to three, we use foundations every day, K to three. Um, 
It is a systematic and explicit phonics program. So like phonemic awareness, they're manipulating sounds, but they're adding the letters or the graphemes to that. They work on phonics, spelling, handwriting. There is a comprehension component. There's a fluency component. Um, and it is not a standalone. It does not suffice for comprehension. For comprehension and language comprehension, we use the units of study in reading and writing. That starts in kindergarten. We do practice the transfer of the phonics concepts learned in foundations through our authentic reading and writing with authentic texts in our workshop, as well as decodable texts. And we'll talk more about that next. Thanks, Kristen. Um, so as Kristen said, we use both decodable um, texts, which we're going to talk about now. I'm actually going to let my colleague Astrid talk about this. Astrid is our department head um, for elementary special education. Um, so Astrid, I don't know if you want to jump in and Tell us a little bit more about decodable. For sure. Um, so yes, yeah, so we have decodable text for our beginning readers, and this is control text so that we are instructing our students that need that practice with really control specific laser focused um, instruction in, in, um, in the instruction. But we also have a robust um, classroom libraries that are provided with high interest books that reflect a wide range of genres and bands of accuracy um, rates. Um, and this is where we get the authentic um, literature experience for our students. Thanks, Astrid. So I wanna add about um, controlled text, decodable text. Um, first of all, this is a significant investment that we have made as a district over the past year and a half or so. Um, there are just, many new decodable texts that have flooded the market. Um, and the ones that you see on this slide are ones that we've been able to invest in and um, in fact, just put in another large order so that there'll be even more available in classrooms. What we want everyone to understand though about controlled text, about decodable text is that um, just because a text is called decodable doesn't mean that in and of itself, it actually is decodable. You're not just going to hand any decodable text to a child and then expect that they're going to be able to do it. It really has to work in conjunction with the phonics principles that they have been introduced to and taught. And we use decodable text in order to provide more practice um, and application for students who need it. So when we teach a skill in foundations, for example, if we're teaching um, a particular blend or particular sound, we then, or digraph, we then might provide them with um, a decodable text to practice that skill. Sometimes we'll provide in our kindergarten and first grade classrooms an opportunity for all students to practice. And then there are students who are going to need a lot more opportunity to practice with that skill. And we want to um, continue to give them more decodable text to support practicing that skill. So we make those decisions based on what the student is showing us in their development and what they need. Um, it's not a one size fits all. And um, we want to be very um, deliberate and intentional around which decodables go and go to which students because it has to do with what skills they're practicing. Um, and as Astrid said, in addition, we have very large, diverse collections in our classrooms um, that are uncontrolled text. And I'm, I'm actually going to ask Tony um, Carlson, our director of libraries and innovation, to talk a little bit more because we have these very diverse collections in our classrooms um, that are accessible to all students and um, really reflect lots of different cultures and genres and authors. But our school libraries um, are also another source of lots of uncontrolled text, but um, imp really important literature. So Tony, you wanna to talk a little bit about what we have available in schools as well? Absolutely, and I'm happy to do it and happy to be here to talk about some of these amazing resources we have in the library. Um, so we also have a vast collection of both fiction and nonfiction in every subject matter at every level. Um, in addition to our regular text, we have a lot of online and audio um, options. And so at every school, 
Um, a student can check out a book online through Sora. Um, we begin teaching students how to use Sora in second grade. Um, they check out a book online just as they would um, in the library. These books are both ebooks and they have audiobook selections as well. And those range all different levels and all different genres. Um, we have tumble to books, tumble books for our younger learners um, that also are audible and can read aloud with a with a student, which is excellent. Um, we have we offer Trueflix and we are starting to offer something called Capstone Interactive, um, which are really high quality ebooks and audiobooks. And audiobooks are excellent for students who um, are reading. So not only are you practicing reading through regular text, but with audiobooks, you're practicing hearing fluent reading happen. Um, so it's a great alternative. So if you go to any one of our school library pages, which you can get to from the school website, um, you can click on ebooks and you'll find all of these. They're available at home for you to check out. Um, many of these have usernames and password, and there are um, documents on each of those pages with those usernames and passwords. So they won't be mysteries to you. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. So the other- And can I just add one more thing about books? Yes, we also please, have please. lots of picture books at elementary school. Um, if you go into a classroom, you'll see the teachers use picture books, especially in our units for different um, comprehension strategies. And so um, that I think is a really big part, even in upper grade classrooms, picture books are used all the time in our, in our work in the elementary. Thanks, Melissa. It's a good reminder. There's so many beautiful picture books um, and more and more come out every year and there's just never enough time to read all of them. So we do use them in all of our classrooms. Um, we want to talk a little bit about assessment because um, we've referred a couple of times to thinking about what children need and, um, and we want to talk about how we know that. And so we have a number of assessments that we use in literacy K to five. Um, in kindergarten, we have uh, Hegarty, all, not just as our curriculum, but we also have a phonemic awareness assessment um, from Hegarty that really helps us understand where each child is in their development of phonemic awareness um, that is given individually um, to our kindergartners three times a year. And if we see um, as children exit kindergarten or, or in first grade, or even sometimes in second grade, if we're seeing that they're not secure in some of their skills, we will continue to assess them in Hegarty until um, we see that they are secure in their skills. Um, Dibbles, eighth, uh, known as Dynamic Indicators of Early Literacy Skills, is a really important assessment that we use. Um, it's also uh, an approved, a Massachusetts approved dyslexia screener. Uh, it is given to all of our students individually in K-2. We've started assessing some of our third graders this year with Dibbles as well. Um, when we have, if there's a, a student who um, exited second grade and um, showed up on Dibbles as not yet secure in um, a particular skill area on Dibbles, we have reassessed them in third grade. And next year we'll be um, giving Dibbles to all of our students, K to three. Um, there's a QR code on your screen that will lead you to um, a one pager that really breaks down what is assessed in Dibbles, but Dibbles is really something that we look at to understand um, children's development in decoding. Um, and so when we see that a child um, is is not secure yet in their skill development in Dibbles, we may look at Hegarty again. So we do make some decisions about how um, much we need to uh, dig deeper for a, an understanding of a child's development. So um, Dibbles is a, a critical piece. Um, and then we also, within our foundations curriculum, have end of unit tests and foundations, um, as a reminder, is something we teach in K to three classrooms and at the end of each unit there is a test and um, it just helps us understand where a child is in relationship to what has been taught and if there needs to be some reteaching we make sure that that happens um, and then we also 
use the benchmark assessment system. Um, and this is an assessment um, given individually to children in grades K through five. Uh, and it helps us look at within a particular band of accuracy where a child is able to read with 95% accuracy or above, um, it allows us to really look at what they're able to do with comprehension. And we look in three different areas. We call them with, within the text, which is really about literal comprehension. What happened in the story? What did you learn from this um, uh, what did you learn from the information in the story? It helps us understand beyond the text, which is really about inferential thinking. And it helps us see what a child is able to understand about character traits, for example, um, and the bigger ideas. And then about the text, uh, which is really about author moves and text structure um, and how a child is, is thinking about that. And so the benchmark assessment system really allows us within a child's, again, range or band of accuracy, we're able to see what they're able to do with compre comprehension. It's, it's really helpful information for us um, to understand where else we need to teach into. I'm going to um, let my colleagues talk a little bit more about our on-demand writing assessments and our pre and post reading assessments. So I don't know if Melissa or Nina wants to jump in. Sure, Nina. So oh, sure. in, in all the K-5 classrooms, children are administered an on-demand assessment, we call it. So before teaching a unit of study, the child will be asked to write a piece in that genre. And then the teacher will have that piece to look at and to plan for instruction um, based on the learning targets of the unit. You did perfectly, Melissa. I mean, it really is just a reminder to all of us that the way teachers plan for each day, each week, each unit, each child um, needs to be individual. And the best way we can find out what a kid could do in terms of being a writer is to find out in that moment in time, what are they able to do with this type of writing? So we do ask students to write at the beginning, and then we ask them to write a similar story similarly structured piece at the end so we can see that growth. And Melissa, do you want to talk about reading? You want me to do it? Well, yeah, I could do that. So we do do uh, three to five, grades three to five. We have a pre, they have a pre-reading assessment where they have um, a passage that they read, and the teacher, um, and then the child will answer questions from that passage that has to do with comprehension. Um, Again, like the on-demand, there's a pre-assessment. So the teacher administers the assessment and then can look at the data to plan for small group target instruction. Um, and then at the and end of the so unit- We're so lucky that we have um, learning progressions that help teachers know if a student isn't quite where they need to be, what needs to be done um, to move that child along. And if a student is already beyond what we might've expected for that grade level, we also have that progression. So we can keep going no matter where that child is at. Exactly. The other thing I would say too, is that we also want to create, teachers create goals with students with those micro progressions and with those pre and post assessments. Um, that they're working on throughout the unit. And those goals may change depending upon how the child's changing as a reader or a writer. And we'll often ask students, um, so what are you working on as a reader? And that's where the, you know, they'll often they'll be able to tell us because it's based on those goals that um, Melissa and Nina have mentioned. So all of this assessment really does help us understand where our students are in their development. Um, and I'm gonna hand it over to um, Jordan Hoffman, our principal at Schofield, to talk about the work that we've been doing as a district. Um, lots of professional development and new learning for all of us around multi-tiered systems of support, um, which is really about reaching each and um, every individual child. So Jordan, you wanna tell us a little bit more? Thanks, Jen. Yeah, a multi-tiered system of support really helps us ensure that every student is appropriately challenged and experiences continuous growth. Uh, MTSS is equity at work. Uh, it begins with strong tier one instruction. Uh, this is the instruction that all students receive. Our math and literacy department heads um, and teachers have identified the essential standards at each grade level that are part of a guaranteed and viable curriculum. These are the standards that we must ensure all students have met prior to the end of the school year. 
Through regular cycles of inquiry, we're able to identify the students who need something more or something different, whether that be enrichment or intervention. We are currently working closely with Dr. Hanna Tola on creating a data dashboard that will allow us to more easily evaluate the progress of groups of students as well as individual students over time. This year, we have identified five data cycles at the elementary level. These include three benchmark periods at the fall, winter, and spring benchmark, as well as uh, progress monitoring meetings that we're holding uh, in between each of those benchmarks to ensure that students are moving along and progressing appropriately. Um, and this helps us also to identify students who may need tier two or tier three instruction if they aren't making that effective progress. And really the difference between the tier two and tier three intervention or instruction is the frequency and intensity of the intervention. Uh, during collaborative team meetings, which happen weekly during the school day, as well as after school and early release days, teachers and our instructional coaches meet to determine what it is we need students to learn, how we're going to know if they learn it, how we'll respond if they already know it, and then what steps will we take if a student hasn't learned it. Um, with MTSS, I think the big shift is from a focus on instruction to a focus on the impact of our instruction. Teachers are working so hard in this coordinated way to meet the needs of all of our students this year. And, you know, in talking with my principal colleagues, we're really pleased with the progress we've made thus far in implementing a multi-tiered system of support. Thanks, Jordan. Um, another really important piece to the work that we're doing as a district, um, you know, we always are engaged in professional development. Our teachers work really hard. Um, ever, education is really ever changing. And um, as things change, we adjust, we learn more. And one of the pieces of work that we're doing now um, at the elementary level is really thinking about um, the shifting of our work in the in the prompting that we do for our readers when um, we're working on a piece of text and they're working on decoding. And so we've really um, shifted and are in the process of continuing to shift our practice to focus on the word level um, rather than first looking at the pictures or thinking about what some what would make sense, we really want to direct our students' attention to the print and to think about what sounds are in those words, um, what letters are in those words, and um, and really work on on sounding it out at the word level. And so, um, there is a book that we are engaging with called "Shifting the Balance," and um, uh, one of our literacy specialists, Lisa Mortarelli, who is our literacy specialist at Honeywell and Sprague, um, who's not here tonight, but. Um, she is uh, teaching a class that is beginning in March um, around shifting the balance, uh, and it's a text we have in a lot of teachers' hands, and it's work that we continue to do to really think about making sure that um, we are prompting students at the word level. Um, and I am just going to make a plug too that um, along with uh, the class Lisa will be teaching, Melissa just started a, teaching a class tonight um, to our K and one teachers. I don't know, Melissa, do you want to just give a quick little summary of what you're learning in that or what you're teaching in that class? Well, we did go over prompting. We're going over a lot of the things that we're talking about. Kristen was actually at the class tonight too. Um, we talked a lot about um, orthographic mapping and today's. Uh, I feel like we talked a lot about blending and um, also bringing joy into the workshop. And so it's a balance of, you know, we're teaching skills and we're also teaching a love of reading. Great. Thank you. So um, that really, uh, I think, is all of the pieces of the work that we're doing currently. Um, and again, ever changing, always, always um, learning more and trying to get better at what we do. As Sandy mentioned at the beginning, when we opened um, earlier this evening, we did receive a number of questions um, through the link that was sent out. And um, up until this morning, we took everything and tried to put it together into some frequently asked questions. And so I'll go through each one of these and um, each of us is taking a different piece of the questions. But um, the first one that I want to read and then address right away is um, one of the questions that has come up is why is Wellesley Public Schools continuing to use curriculum materials that have recently been criticized? And some of you who are on this call tonight might be familiar with a podcast that was released in October called Soul to Story. Um, and it's really taken the nation by storm, I'll say. Um, it's definitely 
um, an incredibly well um, put together, well produced podcast that is very um, engaging and um, includes a lot of really important information. And um, we also, as a district, have taken a good hard uh, listen to it. And um, as many in the world of literacy have, um, and we, in addition to always being on top of what is current, um, we constantly want to look at our curricular materials and really think about what is best for our students. And um, one of the things that we've thought a lot about and really understand is that there's no single curriculum that is um, going to be a one size fits all. There's just no single, there are many basal programs, for example, that are out on the market. Some of you may have heard of things like wit and wisdom. Those are boxed curriculum that really are designed to be a one size fits all. And that's not um, what we believe in. We really believe in um, that, that our work is about teacher knowledge, um, about making sure we're using appropriate assessments, that we um, always have ongoing professional development um, and that we have a commitment to continuous improvement. And, it, and it's through the high quality materials that we use that um, we are able to reach um, or continue to strive to reach each of our students. We have made changes over the past couple of years, um, particularly around phonics and um, phonemic awareness. Um, we've gotten much better at being very targeted in our focus with um, children who need more of that work. Um, and we feel really good about the systematic phonics um, and the phonemic awareness programs that we've put into place um, in consultation with, um, with content leaders at the um, Mass Department of Ed, um, in consultation with other districts um, internally. Um, and, and it's important to know that we teach systematic phonics and we teach the other side of that rope language comprehension. And that's really the work that we do within the units of study. And I know. Um, this has come up at some of the coffees. And I think it's important to note, um, we used um, K through five, we used 24 units. And Kristen, you're gonna jump in if I get this wrong, but we used um, 24, there are 24 units in the units of study K through five. Um, two of them, two of those 24 are print-based units that have been revised. And that's actually part of the class that Melissa started teaching tonight. Um, and we think those revisions are really good. Um, and they really um, provide opportunities for practice and application for our students around the systematic phonics work that we're doing. Um, so I think that answers that question, go ahead. Can I just clarify that the other 22 are heavily comprehension focused? So the yeah. majority of our units of study is our comprehension work, and we get our phonics and phonemic awareness from foundations. That's right. That's right. Thanks, Kristen. And I was just going to put a plug in for the importance of how the units of study have brought book clubs as a structure for all students. Um, we do it heavily in grades three through five, but students as young as first grade and even our kindergartners occasionally will be involved in book clubs. Um, and we know as adults how powerful reading um, within a supportive community could be. And, and we want to make sure that we continue to offer that to our students. Um, anyone out there who has a third through fifth grader, um, if you ask them about what they love about reading, oftentimes it will be the book clubs. Thanks, Nina. And um, it's important to know with our book clubs, and Nina had mentioned even as young as kindergarten sometimes, but regardless of grade level, um, book clubs are something that all of our students can access, even if um, they are challenged in their decoding ability, we make sure that we use our technology tools so that, um, that they can access that complex text um, because often there may be children who um, are more challenged in their development of decoding, but we wanna really support that higher level critical thinking that we, you know, um, value so much and know is so important. And it's often those students who really can shine um, because they um, are able to really think and talk about books and even um, 
write about books, even though the decoding might not come as easily. So I think that's an important note as well. Jen, can I say one more thing too? Um, I do think student agency with book choice too, even in our kindergarten classrooms, they're doing decodable text that's large group, but the kids also do have choice to have books that they're reading and also books that they um, are looking at. And that's an important piece as well. Yeah, thank you. I'm gonna move on to our next question. Um, how can I find out about my child's progress in reading? And I'm going to let Ellen Quirk, our principal at Honeywell, speak to this one. Um, I think she speaks for all of us. Um, but Ellen, maybe you can take that question. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm happy to. Um, one thing I think um, all of you have done is attended a back to school night. And at that back to school night, um, the teachers always tell you, how they can be reached through email, leaving a message on their phone. They'll tell you the, the you know, their preference for being contacted. So they do that in a, so that you know that at any point, if you ever have a question about your student, you can either pick up the phone or shoot an email and that teacher will be back to you um, as quickly as possible. In addition to that, there are um, four specific times we formally share data on the students. Two of those are conferences. One, the first conference late October, early November is really the opportunity for teachers to kind of tell you what they've learned about your student, to ask what your goals might be for the student, um, to share some initial data that we have on your student after the summer, um, after they've returned from the summer and participated in the fall assessments. And it's it's a really an opportunity to build that relationship so that as time goes on, you have a question, you know, you can call. If there's something that the teacher indicates, you know, I'm going to keep an eye on this. Um, but, you know, right now we're, the children are still in the process of learning. But I'll keep an eye on it. If some, something should develop, I'll let you know. Um, our first um, standards-based report card is about to come out in January. Um, that will kind of tell you how your student's doing according to the standards that your child needs to meet by the end of the school year. That's followed by a formal conference in um, April where you'll get updated information on your students' progress as, they, as we move into the final parts of the year. And then the standards-based report card again is issued at the very end of the year, letting you know where your student is meeting in those standards. Um, I also want you to know that teachers meet weekly um, in collaborative team meetings where they're looking at student work, talking about student work, principals, literacy coaches, math coaches attend these meetings and we're constantly discussing students. We're constantly deciding, is this, should, should, should you reach out to the parent at this point? Um, if we are more concerned about a particular student, we have a student support process and the teacher brings that student's work to a team um, of teachers, usually a psychologist, a special educator, the literacy and math coach might be there. And we unpack what the student is able to do and what we want the student to be able to do. And before your child is brought to that process, you are you receive a phone call and we the teacher would share, we have a concern about um, your student in this area. I'm gonna take it to a team of professionals. They're gonna analyze the student work. We're gonna set a goal. I'm gonna call you after the meeting, let you know what that goal is. And we're gonna progress monitor your student to let, us, to let us know if your child's reaching that goal. If the child is reaching that goal, great. If the child is still struggling, we might put a new goal in place or a different goal in place. So the, the act of communicating about children's progress in schools happens continuously. There are the four formal times you'll know about it. Um, or hear from us. And then the more informal times, if you have a question or you say, you know, I'd like to see my ch children's fund um, foundations assessments, or I'd like to know how my child did on the dibbles um, in January, or is anybody concerned about any particular area? These are all questions um, you can ask. We're also working with teachers during the conferences to tell you more than just what level your child's reading at according to BASP. We really want them to be talking to you about what your child is able to do as a reader and our goals for them in the future as a reader. Um, and that could be around accuracy. It could be around comprehension. It could be around fluency. Um, so that, you know, so the teachers are trying to be as specific as possible. But if you have a question um, and you say, you know, you told me my students in uh, level M, I don't know what that means. They would be able to unpack that for you. Um, so please feel free at any point to just reach out and talk to your classroom 
um, teacher and, and ask any questions you have. Uh, they do have samples of their writing, um, samples of their reading assessments, so they would be more than able to share anything that, that you would need to know. Thank you, Ellen. Um, I just want to note that we have about 10 minutes left, but we are going to get through all of our questions. So um, our next question is, what other curriculum is available in the district? And Astrid Mazariegos, our department head for special education, um, I'm going to let you talk about that a little bit because sure. I know there are other pieces of curriculum we use with some students. For sure. So not all, but some of our students in special education uh, may be um, getting their instruction through a Wilson. Ravo, reading milestones, Edmark, uh, visualizing and verbalizing to name a couple of curriculums. But then again, we honor the team process. Uh, it's a conversation with parents. It's a team meeting with parents. Um, echoing um, Ellen's um, words, the communication is there. We, If, if we are proposing a different curriculum, parents, uh, families are involved in that discussion as part of the team process. Thanks, Astrid. Um, the next question, I actually love this question. Um, and I think Kristen and Melissa will tackle it, but how as a parent can I encourage writing or support the writing that is occurring in the classroom? What do you say, Kristen? So that's such a broad question and such a great question that I struggled with as a parent as well. Um, in the schools, we teach three types of writing throughout the year, starting in kindergarten. We teach narrative, we teach information writing, and we teach opinion writing, which could be a simple sign sharing an opinion in kindergarten, like don't run in the hall, or in third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, that is a persuasive essay or a literary essay. So the first thing I would recommend is look at your newsletter and see what type of writing your student is engaging in. But we want our children engaging in authentic writing of their own choice as well. So anytime there's an opportunity to write a letter or um, journal or write authentically, make lists when they're young, make lists of movies to watch or what to pack to go to grandma's or places they wanna visit in the summer, Anything you can do to encourage writing is helpful. Keeping in mind that there's two types of writing, really. There's writing to think, where students do on their own as they process their ideas that might not have a polished, finished structure. And there's writing for an audience, which should have a more polished and finished structure. So giving our students room for both to mess around with their writing and writing for an audience where they might involve several drafts or some rewriting. Melissa, what do you want yeah. to add? Being a primary teacher, I would say that I would get some tools like these little flare pens and blank papers and a stapler. I think it's really natural for our K-1-2 kids to make books at home, the books that we're making in school. I would completely encourage that. Send those books in. The, the, the classroom will love to hear them too. And Christian, just like you said, I would probably a journal for an, uh, an older student and encourage them to, to um, do some journaling could be a nice way to do that reading, that writing connection. Thank you both. I was going to add one more thing, which was just to say that we know that writing is a form of communication. Um, and so is talking. So we do a lot of oral rehearsal in school, um, kindergarten, but really through fifth grade where we talk through our ideas. And that's something you could definitely do at home, um, both connected to school, but also just in your family life. Um, and also reading books as a writer is another thing that you can do as a parent um, to notice language that you love um, when you're reading, doing your nightly read aloud to your to your child to just really dive into the language and notice what um, what makes that author's work special and that will help them as a writer as well. Thanks, Nina. And so will all that vocabulary in the reading. I'm thinking about my own high school student who I've been getting on about needing to read more so that she can improve her writing. Um, when I read her writing, I'm often saying, so how much have you been reading lately? Um, so our last question, is about reading. How can I encourage my child to branch out and read different things? They only read graphic novels. We hear this a lot, actually. So Nina, do you want to start with that? And Tony, then we'll continue. 
Sure. Um, I wanted just to start to say that there's a lot to love about graphic novels. They've come a really long way. Uh, they are now in all of the different genres. So you could be reading a graphic novel that is realistic fiction, fantasy, historical fiction, and informational texts. Students are reading about historical events through graphic novels, but also things like volcanoes. Um, also, we love graphic novels because they do make um, so much of reading accessible for kids, kids who have struggled, but really all kids. It is such a wonderful way to scaffold visualizing, and visualizing is such an important part of comprehension. Now, having said all that, sometimes we do notice that students get stuck, and being able to work through connected text is very important. So I think the best advice I know of is um, Timothy Shanahan recommends the idea of um, using an analogy for students, probably one about healthy eating. We know that if we're going to eat healthy, we need to vary our diet, fruits and vegetables with a little bit of dessert at the end. Um, and to just level with your, your child and say to them, you only are reading graphic novels, we need to branch out and then make a plan for that. The plan might include sharing some reading at home, so doing more read aloud from the kinds of books that you were hoping that your child might um, enter into on their own, um, and eventually, you know, celebrating that success when they do start to move away from graphic novels as their only part of their reading diet. But Tony you. probably has more ideas. I was going to say, Tony, well, I know you can add a lot as well. Yeah. Well, Nina, actually, all of what you said was what I was going to say, too. Absolutely. Um, and in our libraries, where our book, where our children come to check out books weekly, um, we do try to expose them to many different types of literature. And again, I will echo Nina's um, love for graphic novels because there are some amazing ones. But um, I also agree with reading at home. I think it is, it's so important. One of my favorite memories is riding in the car with my children and listening to audiobooks together and being able to talk about those. And I got to pick those audiobooks and they were exposed to different um, literature than they ever had been before. And they couldn't wait to start new books then. Um, it was just such a warm family time that I can't encourage it enough. And again, we have all of those type audiobooks available through our libraries. Um, and yeah, and the other thing that I would say is we as librarians always try to encourage children to take out several different kinds of books. So hey, you love graphic novels? Awesome. Take one out. But let's try this different novel. What other things are you interested in? So I think really talking to your child and really asking them questions about what they're interested in will help you steer you and your child to different reading. Um, one last thing, at the end of every year, um, the librarians all get together and publish a list of highly recommended books. Um, those lists and all past lists are available. Let me know if you um, aren't able to find them on our websites. Um, I'm happy to share them with you because they are some really excellent literature that we would recommend for you and your family. Thank you so much, Tony. I did actually did not mean to change the slide on you like that, but oh, that's fine. Um, but as I look at the time, we actually that was our last question, and um, we just want to say that we appreciate everyone for joining us. I do want to um, also really thank all of my colleagues here for the, all of the work not the not just for tonight and and presenting, but all of the work that. Um, all of us do every day um, is just so appreciated. Um, and we appreciate everyone for attending. I don't know, Sandy, if you have a last word. Well, thank you again to Jen Friedman, who does an incredible job every day and kudos for all your literacy coffees and this presentation as well. Our gratitude goes out to you. And I can't say enough, um, just echoing the tremendous talent of this team um, and the entire literacy department, student services department, directors, principals. Um, it's really an extraordinary uh, collaborative effort. And um, there is tremendous talent expertise across the district to teach K-5 literacy. 
So any questions about anything that was discussed tonight, don't hesitate to reach out to any one of us. We're happy to answer questions, um, sit with you, talk with uh, more in depth about um, individual questions or needs. We're here to be a resource and a support. And I know I speak for all of us when we say that. Um, this will be posted to our website, the literacy part of our website. Principals will put that out as a resource to the communities um, along with the frequently asked questions and and uh, the slide deck. So we hope you'll take a look for that. Um, thank you again. Have a wonderful evening. We're going to wave goodnight. Thank you for your time.